In this video, we will go over the steps necessary to solve a typical multi-part question involving balanced chemical reactions, limiting reagents, precipitates, and concentrations of ions in solution. In this problem, we will be looking at 100 milliliters of aqueous potassium hydroxide, which is 0 0.200 molar, when mixed with 200 milliliters of aqueous nickel-2 sulfate, which is 0 0.150 molar. Always pay attention to the significant figures of your volumes and concentrations. The first step in this type of problem should be to write down the chemical formulae of the compounds involved. Make sure you know the ions and their charges, or the rest of your calculations will be incorrect. From there, you should be able to write down the balanced chemical equation, including physical states. Use your solubility chart to predict any precipitates. In this case, nickel-2 hydroxide forms a precipitate. Along with the balanced equation, you will often be asked to provide the total ionic and net ionic equations. In order to figure out which reactant is limiting, we need to calculate the moles of each reactant. This can be done by multiplying their respective concentrations by the respective volumes, shown here. The limiting reagent limits the amount of product formed, so in order to figure out which reactant is limiting, we must calculate how much product can be formed from each reactant if that particular reactant is fully consumed. The reactant that produces the least amount of product is the limiting reactant. For example, let's say technically the equation to form a sandwich is as follows. One slice of cheese and two slices of bread make one sandwich. We can look at this the same way as a chemical equation. So, if you had one piece of cheese and ten slices of bread, how many sandwiches can you make? From a balanced equation, one piece of cheese means you can make one sandwich. With ten pieces of bread, you can make five sandwiches. So in this case, the cheese limits the amount of sandwiches formed, so it is the limiting reagent. The cheese will be fully consumed before the bread, and we cannot make any more sandwiches once the one piece of cheese is consumed. So the reactant that produces the least amount of product is our limiting reagent. Now let's apply that same logic to the problem at hand. We've already calculated the number of moles of each reactant. We then have to use the balanced equation to calculate the amount of product that could theoretically form if each reactant is fully consumed. What I do here is compare the mole ratio of each reactant to the precipitate in order to calculate the theoretical number of moles of precipitate that can form. Based on the initial numbers of moles of each reactant, we can see that potassium hydroxide is a limiting reagent since it forms a smaller amount of product. Conceptually, this means that once 1.00 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of nickel-2 hydroxide forms, the potassium hydroxide will be fully consumed and no more precipitate can form. By figuring out the limiting reagent, we've basically figured out the theoretical yield of precipitate. The amount of precipitate that can form is based off of the limiting reagent. Remember, the limiting reagent determines the amount of product that can form. Typically, you are asked to calculate the theoretical yield of precipitate in grams. Simply use the molar mass of the precipitate along with the theoretical yield in moles to calculate the theoretical yield in grams. We can use the balanced equation along with an IRF table to calculate the number of moles of species at the end of the reaction. IRF means initial, react, final. Typically, the number used in IRF tables are in moles. At the beginning of this video, we calculated the initial amounts of each reactant. There are no products formed at the start of the reaction. We know that potassium hydroxide is the limiting reagent, so it gets fully consumed, meaning all of it reacts and there is none of it left at the end of the reaction. From there, you must use the balanced equation and mole ratios to calculate the other values. At this point, it is important to remember that we are calculating the concentration of ions that remain in solution which means that we are only interested in species that are aqueous. The solid precipitate is not to be considered. From the IRF table, it should be clear that the species in solution, once the reaction is complete, are nickel-2 sulfate and potassium sulfate, which means the ions remaining in solution are nickel-2+, the sulfate ion, and the potassium ion. In this example, there is 0 0.0200 moles of nickel-2 sulfate remaining in solution. Since each ion is present in a 1 to 1 ratio, that means there is the same amount of each ion in solution.
there is 0.0100 mole of potassium sulfate remaining in solution, which allows us to calculate the amount of each ion separately. Remember, for every one mole of potassium sulfate, there are two moles of potassium ion. Now that we have the amounts of each ion in moles, we simply divide by the total volume to find the concentration of each ion. Remember, we mixed 100 mils of potassium hydroxide with 200 mils of nickel-2 sulfate, so the total volume is 300 milliliters. It should also be noted that since the potassium ion and the sulfate ion are spectator ions, that the amount of moles of each ion in solution remains unchanged over the course of the reaction. Initially, there was 0.0200 moles of potassium ion and 0.0300 moles of sulfate ion, and those numbers remain unchanged over the course of the reaction.